Καλησπέρα σας. Good evening and welcome to the Archaeological Research Unit. Dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to welcome back to the Archaeological Research Unit's public lecture series Professor Peter Fischer and Dr. Teresa Burger, the Director and Assistant Director of the Excavations of the New Swedish Cyprus Expedition at Halas Sultan Teke, Dromolakshya Vizagya. Before we start, I would like to congratulate them both for the recent publication of their book entitled Two Late Cypriot City Quarters at Halas Sultan Teke, the Zoderberg Expedition 2010-2017. And you can see a copy of the book here, and there's some copies of the book on sale outside on a special price just for this evening. So uh, if you like, you can get your own copy at the end of the lecture. Professor Fischer is well known for his excavations in Jordan, Palestine, and of course Cyprus. He's also well known for his interdisciplinary research on the cultures of the Bronze and Iron Ages of the Eastern Mediterranean, and his doctoral thesis, which he submitted to the Department of Historical Studies, Ancient Culture and Civilization of the University of Gothenburg, was entitled Applications of, Te of Technical Devices in Archaeology, the Use of X-rays, Microscope, Electrical and Electromagnetic Devices, and Subsurface Interface Radar. It is thus not surprising that the new Swedish Cyprus expedition is well known for the use of geophysics and other advanced technologies in the investigation and recording of the excavation, as we will hear shortly. Professor Fischer is particularly interested in cultural synchronization and absolute chronology, and is a member of the steering committee for the Arcane Project, which deals with cultural synchronization and absolute chronology of cultures in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Levant, and Mesopotamia. He has excavated the ancient city of Tal Abu al-Haraz in the Jordan Valley, where substantial remains from the early Middle and Late Bronze Ages have been revealed. He's also the director of the excavations at the site of Tel El Ajul, which lies just south of the modern city of Gaza, and is one of the most important Middle and Late Bronze Age cities in Palestine. Professor Fischer is also the coordinator of a large research project entitled The Collapse of Bronze Age Societies in the Eastern Mediterranean, Sea Peoples in Cyprus, and this is funded by the Swedish Research uh, Council. Uh, according to Professor Fischer, the nucleus of the project is the study of the economic, political, and climatological situation in Cyprus, the center of international trade in the Eastern Mediterranean. So uh, we will expect another lecture on this subject next year. <laughs> Unless you have, again, amazing finds from Halas Sultan Teke, and we have to postpone it for the year after. Uh, Dr. Burge has studied classical archaeology at the University of Vienna, where she also followed minor studies in Old Semitic philology and Oriental archaeology, Greek philology, and Scandinavian studies. She carried on the same carried on at the same university for her doctoral studies and graduated with distinction. Her thesis was entitled "An Early Iron Age Compound at El Abu El Haraz, Jordan Valley." Traditional Innovation and Intercultural Relations in the Eastern Mediterranean around 1100 BCE. Since 2011, she's the Assistant Field Director at the new Swedish Cyprus Expedition in Hala Sultan Teke and the Swedish Jordan Expedition at Tel Abu Al Haraz. Tonight, they will speak to us about Hala Sultan Teke, new discoveries in the late Cypriot city and cemetery. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and invitation, and thank you all for coming. So, I will talk about uh, uh, the recent, uh, recent discoveries at Hala Sultan Teke, but of course I will also show some, uh, let's say, more striking finds from earlier excavations, some goodies. So, uh, this is uh, our team uh, from 2017, and I will also show you the team from 2018. <laughs> this, this, th th these guys to the right are, uh, belong to our geophysical team. They did the uh, uh, um, magnetometer survey and the radar survey. They are from Eastern Atlas in Berlin. This is the team from this year, May, June uh, 2018. 
Usually the expedition uh, um, consists of, um, let's say, between 25, 30 people, something like this. Okay, uh, I just want to show you the chronology which I use, and this is mainly based on uh, radiocarbon and intercultural relation. And it's, it's somewhat higher than the chronology used by my former teacher and good friend, Paul Ostrom. Somewhat higher, not very much. And uh, the reason why I, I wrote LC 3A, Late Seabird 3A, 1150, doesn't stop there, but Halasunten Teke was destroyed approximately at that time. So there's nothing from, from uh, periods after this, uh, uh, let's say the middle or the later part of Late Seabird 3A. And these are the sites which are uh, of importance to the excavation since the, all these sites uh, have remains from the late Cypriot period, the late Bronze Age. And in our book we have referred to uh, all of them, in fact. And this is the area of uh, Hala Sultan Teke. You see the, the mosque in the background, the Salt Lake, and, and the airport is somewhere here. And the area of the city maybe is as large as 50 hectare. We have so far uh, surveyed 23 hectare and everywhere are remains of from the these uh, late Cypriot uh, occupants. And this is a digital elevation model uh, uh, mainly done by by our drone and uh, and also uh, photographs taken by the police helicopter of the <laughs> A helicopter di a division at the Lanaka airport. So the, the police was very interested in our excavation, much more interested in our excavations than to give uh, tickets to speeding people. <laughs> so they helped us a lot with, with photographs. So we we're very happy about it. And you see here the, the, the different city quarters. Uh, the book in front of you is uh, deals with city quarter one and city quarter two, just these two city quarters, but there are more city quarter three. This one we started to excavate uh, this year uh, because we found some amazing uh, structures uh, uh, by the magnetometer survey. And this is the area of the cemetery, very close to the mosque. And the distance from here to City Quarter 1 is approximately five to 600 meters. This is another photograph taken by the police helicopter and showing the, the different city quarters, one, two, three, and four and area A in the background to the right. So the objectives of the project, just a repetition of what I said uh, the last year, uh, we want to find out how large the city was. And we have a very, very fortunate situation at Hala Sultan Teke because there's, there are no buildings there. So there is a possibility to protect uh, an amazing site. But of course, this is a, a, a matter of, of, of resources and, and so on. But it, this would be very worthwhile to protect the whole, the whole area. But there are other problems, as you know, uh, because uh, the land formerly belonged to the, the area of the mosque. So uh, geophysical prospecting has uh, uh, revealed some, let's say, around 25 hectare of, of occupied area. But it may be as, be as large as 50 hectare, which would make it one of the largest uh, 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 Eastern Mediterranean cities. And here are the different methods which we used, uh, um, uh, magnetometer, radar, and of course, a uh, 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 very accurate GPS. And this uh, uh, we used in 2017. This is a, a, a special arrangement. We have 10 sensors in a row, so we can cover five meters at a time, which meant that we could survey 23 hectares in five days. Of course, the area is quite, uh, quite uh, convenient for this method because it's quite flat. And these are the results of this uh, survey. And uh, we found some interesting structures. I don't know if this is possible to see for you. Which 
may be the city wall. They have to find it. It could be the city wall because you see the difference in, in the structures inside and outside, inside and outside. And this is approximately 23 hectare. And here is a detail of the area uh, which we call uh, city quarter four. And uh, the town plan, I would say, to some extent, resembles, to some extent, resembles the town plan of Enkomi. So uh, another uh, objective is uh, to, to, uh, to study chronology, absolute chronology, with the help of radiocarbon and relative chronology by synchronizing the various cultures uh, from the same period. And then the studies of the sea peoples phenomenon. I'm not talking about the sea peoples as peoples. It's a kind of phenomenon. It's, it's something which is, uh, it's, it's not only uh, migrating people, it's something that has to do with climate changes and, uh, and so on and so on. This is a quite complicated uh, matter and uh, uh, Teresa and me, we just uh, last year we published a book about the Sea Peoples. It came out in the, at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have it with us, no? No. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, material studies, of course, and then uh, um, which, which is uh, very important the protection of the site. And as uh, Anna knows, uh, Anna Staraki, we, we built a fence as soon as we have opened an area. We built a fence uh, to protect the excavated uh, remains. And here is uh, uh, CQ1, CT quarter one, situation at the end of uh, uh, 2018, in June 2018. And the last season, we, the latest season, we excavated in this part. And we have so far uh, three strata. Strata is, uh, um, by my definition, layers of occupation, three successive layers of occupation. Stratum one, the most recent, stratum three, which we have found uh, 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 last year, is the most, uh, the, the, the most ancient occupation. But we have indication of a stratum four, which we will try to expose the next year. And this is, uh, so you get an impression about uh, the, 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 let's say the, the state of the remains, so the walls are quite high, uh, uh, still preserved, and uh, they have very nice context. In the background, you see, by the way, the Salt Lake, Lanaka Salt Lake. This is a plan of the Siku uh, uh, 1, City Quarter 1, the most recent stratum. Then, uh, next stratum, stratum 2. And I show you a detail of stratum 2. And then the next uh, uh, slide will show stratum 3. And then you can see a different building technique. So the walls are, are wider, more massive. So, but we don't know very much about stratum 3 yet. We have to expose more. And as regards the, the dating, uh, stratum 1 is late seaport 3A. You are somewhere in the middle first half of the uh, 13, uh, 12th century. Stratum 2 is around 1200, and Stratum 3 is uh, second half of the 13th century, late Cypriot 2C. And this is the result of this year's excavations. We have tons, not tons of slag, maybe we have almost one ton of slag, 750, 780 kilograms slag. And this is just from city quarter one. So we, what we are dealing with is urban metallurgy. And uh, with the help of, of specialists, for example, Lena and uh, Matthias Mehofer, down there from the Vienna University and, and Thilo Rehren, we will try to find out more about uh, 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 copper production. And this picture uh, uh, was taken by, by Matthias Mayhofer at the University of Vienna, and it shows some uh, slag and recycled browns and slag with copper oxides, raw copper, parts of a furnace, and uh, we have also uh, parts of two airs.
This picture I just received from Matthias a couple of weeks ago. Do you want to say something about this, Matthias? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and then some of these uh, goodies, as I said before, <laughs> I showed this before. This is from Stratum Two, the so-called creature crater. Beautiful stuff of a very skilled artist. And the bird crater. And the the horned god crater, which is quite a, an unusual uh, uh, illustration of a god Alphas, which is not very common. It's not in profile, it's, it's shown here all fast. We have in from Statum 1 a so-called violin bow fibula, and um, the, best, the best parallel we found is from Italy. This is from uh, Campestrin in Italy, and it's almost identical with the one we have at Hala Sultan Teke. Yes, and these are some finds from this year, Mycenaean uh, 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 figurine, and then two, two kissing uh, base ring uh, figurines and, and uh, a pommel of ivory. We don't have the dagger, unfortunately, just a pommel. This is another map uh, showing, among others, the, the new uh, uh, city quarter, city quarter four which we fenced uh, this year, just to protect it. And we had, I must say, an extremely understanding farmer. I was very, very happy when I explained to him, you see, we have very important finds here, so what do you say about fencing it? And then I get in contact with Anna and, and Marina, and he agreed without any objections, which I find quite, quite amazing. So. So uh, this is this is a magnetometer map of uh, Siku 4, the new area which we excavated in in uh, in May this year, and you see within this uh, red rectangle we found these structures, and uh, one of these structures is is especially interesting. This one. And we are talking about, again, LC3A, late Cypriot 3A, the first half of the 12th century BC. And what we have here is a bathroom, a beautiful bathroom with ashla blocks. And uh, you see the ashla blocks still in situ, some of them. Others were destroyed, unfortunately, by farming. I will show you why, why farming is so dangerous in this area, uh, uh, in, in one of the other pictures. This is another view of the bathroom seen from the west. And here are quite an amazing uh, structure. This is the water inlet of the bathroom. So there's a channel coming from, uh, from high up and transporting water into the bathroom. So this is the, the inlet, and this is the drain on the other side. And, and the floor of the bathroom is sloping. So quite a clever construction. <coughs> and outside the bathroom, the bathroom is here, this is to the north, we have a long corridor filled with pitos vessels, pito shirts, uh, large vessels, a kind of storage area, and according to the uh, magnetometer map, this corridor is at least 20, 30 meters long, so we have a lot of, of vessels to man. your task. So everything you see here is stratum one, the, the, the most recent stratum, first half of the 12th century BC. And this is the entrance to this corridor, <coughs> where there is a kind of a double gate with um, uh, uh, door sockets and ashlar blocks uh, uh, used uh, as steps. And to the left of the entrance, this is something for Maria. We found a concentration of murex. So uh, we can't tell if they put used uh, uh, purple dye there, but anyhow, 
we have a concentration of molecules, not only there, also at other spots in, in CQ4. So which means that we have uh, evidence of molecules production, of, of pi purple type production in CQ2, and to some extent in CQ1, but also in CQ4. And this picture illustrates the problem with the area. If you look how close the remains are to the surface, if modern blouse, they go, let's say, 25 centimeters be below surface, and, but they cut, they cut the, the most recent layers that Thales Sultan take it. This is, this is a problem. And I was very happy when the farmer agreed, without any objections, <laughs> to fence the area. So now I'm be moving to area A, which is the area of the cemetery, and uh, I just uh, uh, I will give you a short introduction, then Teresa will continue this presentation. Uh, again, uh, area A is approximately 600 meters uh, to the east of uh, uh, CQ1, very close to the mosque. And uh, here again on this map, you can see area A, and uh, Teresa will talk about all these finds which, which we have here. And uh, I would like to show one of the most amazing finds which we made uh, this year, this beautiful chariot crater with uh, uh, chariots and people carrying swords. But this will be presented by Teresa now, please. So moving to area A, um, we know, I will show you later on, that this is a suburban area, it's just outside of the city. And um, some um, previous uh, uh, findings, um, like these uh, two tombs that were excavated in the 60s and published in 76 by Vasos Karagioris, um, Another tomb that was found uh, just in the section of this uh, ditch made in the 50s, which is eroding down um, and which, which was excavated jointly by the Swedish uh, Cyprus expedition and the Department of Antiquities in 2013. Um, another tomb that was found just across the ditch on the parking lot of the mosque, uh, and it was published in 2010. Mm, another tomb located approximately here, um, found in the 70s, which could never be uh, uh, excavated properly, and also another one here. Uh, we assume that we are dealing with a cemetery Uh, also, some tombs, uh, the, the owners of this horse stable uh, told us that a few decades ago, 20, 30 years ago, when they uh, built uh, this parkour, apparently, or according to them, they found some tombs. So also here, uh, more evidence for that. When we saw the results of the magnetic survey, we were very happy because all these black spots indicate pits, which might indicate tombs. And uh, we counted only in this area of 100 by 100 meters, approximately 80 of these pits. We also know now, having this uh, results, that this area is unbuilt. There are no buildings, there are no walls. The results were a bit disappointing, but very interesting again. Uh, we found 22 wells, uh, 15 other pits. I will explain what I uh, mean by other pits. Seven tombs, so, and 13 modern features. So that's the, the blue ones are wells, the red ones are tombs, uh, yellow ones, these other pits, uh, interpreted as offering pits and um, 
This is the area where we worked in 2018 this year. Uh, we opened three more features and we found this very rich tomb RR, uh, which contained, amongst other things, the chariot crater that Peter just um, showed. So um, just a few words to the wells. Uh, one of these 22 wells, um, they look like that when we just uh, on the surface. So it's a uh, round feature, diameter one meter, 1.5 meters. Um, they go down to seven, eight meters, we guess. We have never exposed them because it's very uh, dangerous and difficult. Um, but what they have in common is uh, steps on both sides. And that's how they often look when we just exposed a bit. They are filled with pottery and other stuff. So it's pottery. We found figurines, some of them complete. Uh, we found loom weights, a cylinder seal in one of them, a scarab, bone tools, astragali, fragments of elephant ivory, very precious material, copper slag. Uh, shells and much hexaplex uh, and other animal bones. Of course, always sheep, goat, which is the common uh, animal uh, in the settlement, Co cattle also, uh, donkey, dog, deer, uh, rodents, but also more uncommon skeletons like the turtle. Uh, and then, of course, birds, fish, hedgehog, and so on. The other pits uh, look like wells as regards shape and size, um, but they f are finished after two, three meters. So they are not wells because they did not dig them deep enough to reach water. Um, but what we see very often is this sort of sealing with uh, some ochre substance. And we uh, find the positions of complete objects, um, like pottery and figurines, and also textile production tools, a lamp. Uh, this is a piece of elephant ivory, a bone shuttle. And this is from pit P, which is dated to the um, late separate 1B period. It's actually one of the oldest let's say, closed contexts uh, found at Hala Sultan Deke so far. And another pit is pit B from the 13th century again, uh, complete pottery, uh, a figurine, a notched uh, scapula of uh, cattle. Uh, we also found sheep scapula in uh, some of these wells. And this is one of the very special and exciting objects. It's a spindle. The wooden stuff is still preserved. Um, and the uh, ivory um, uh, whorl. And it has four very thin plates like these, or discs, um, very thin discs. So if you have any idea about the exact function because it must be some sort of textile production tool, but we, we couldn't really figure out what these small disks uh, serve for. So please let us know. Uh, so what we find in these other pits are complete pottery vessels. We have figurines, we have textile production tools, we have astragali again, we have notched scapulae, fragments of elephant ivory, large amounts of hexaplex, and so on and so on. What we do not have are human bones. So these are not tombs. Uh, let's come to a second type of other pits. Um, they have a somewhat different shape. Um, very typically some like eight shape and are also much larger but shell more shallow. 
And again, we found masses of pottery, but usually broken. So some more almost complete uh, vessels, but, but always uh, uh, fragmented. And this is also one of these uh, places where we found the chariot crater in 2016. Uh, and we found uh, four, five more fragmented chariot craters in 2017 in another one of these uh, pits. Uh, this is also pit V where the famous, now famous lady comes from. This is actually also a chariot crater. You see the wheel here. And this uh, beautiful lady, Peter will uh, say a few words uh, later on. Mm, but interesting is that she is actually painted on a part of a vessel that is never painted like that. So the, the part with figures is, should be much more upwards, not on this lower part of the vessel. Um, and just to summarize the second type of pit, uh, just to show you an example of pit V, um, we are still working on the uh, um, processing of the material of uh, the other pits, but pit V is almost done. So we have more than 50 complete profiles. We are still working on some of them. Um, we have hardly any complete vessels. But what you can see here are that we have exclusively, almost exclusively, uh, fine wares, table wares. We have uh, more than 30% of Mycenaean imports in these pits. And uh, it's actually just pottery. So we do not have textile production tools. We have no metal, we have no beads and so on. So it's just pottery. Uh, so one of the ideas is that it could be uh, the remain of one or I guess more uh, ritual feasts. The dating uh, of uh, most of these pits seem to be somewhere between late Cypriot 2A2 and late Cypriot 2C, which is a very long period. Um, but uh, according to our stratigraphical um, observations, we have the feeling that we are dealing with one deposition. So how comes that uh, such a long period is, is represented? Uh, one possibility is that the older vessels that are found in these pits represent something like heirlooms, vessels that were precious and used for a long period and uh, until they ended up uh, in these pits. Another possibility is that these vessels were broken and deposited somewhere else until they were finally buried in these pits in most likely late Cypriot 2 c period. Let's come to the tombs. So uh, I'm not going to say much about tomb X because we uh, presented it uh, last time and it's also published in Basor. Um, but you can see here, this is tomb X, how close these feature, features are to each other. So the wells are just one, two meters uh, next to the tomb, and the uh, pit V is just about uh, 15, 20 meters to tomb X. And yes, this is uh, what we have published, uh, some base ring. Uh, one of the earliest imports, Mycenaean imports, uh, um, to Hala Sultanteke from the late Helladic 2A or B period. And some of the scarabs and the jewelry of this really rich tomb. Let's come to the new discoveries from 2017. Tomb LL has quite a, a similar shape uh, to Tomb X. We have this. Uh, sort of oval or H-shaped uh, pit. And we have a rectangular cut where the skeletons were deposited. So this is not something that we did, but uh, um, this is the place where the skeletons were lying and uh, some pottery vessels around. And some of the finds that uh, came from this tomb is uh, 
bichrome wheel mate where monochrome uh, white slip one we also have white slip two and actually very interesting a set of miniature vessels of white slip base ring and uh, white shaved uh, red lustrous wheel mate and uh, gray lustrous wheel mate and also something quite uncommon <laughs> piriform jar uh, import from Crete, uh, dated to the late Minoan 2 to 3 A period. And uh, this is extremely useful for us because all these base ring and white slip where the dating is quite difficult. So um, this is a much better indication. Um, another extremely interesting find a set of scale weights of hematite. And these are the weights. Uh, so the standard weight is uh, 9.4 grams. So this is three times, two times, uh, and then it goes in uh, just uh, uh, minor parts of this. Uh, then we have uh, some gold and uh, beads. So thanks to this uh, late me known 2 or 3A uh, jar, we can date uh, the tomb to approximately the end of the 15th uh, century BC. Um, we have no complete skeletons from this uh, tomb, so we uh, suppose that we are dealing with uh, secondary burials, uh, and uh, most likely between 9 to 19 individuals uh, at least, depending on how we um, relate the different areas of the tombs which with each other. And this is the r most recent uh, tomb that some of you have seen when you visited Tala Sultantike in spring. Um, again, we have this sort of double chamber. And one of the uh, skeletons, uh, so we have 13 in total, and this is one of them uh, that are almost uh, complete. And uh, so next to uh, the skeleton was a large base ring jug. And on the chest and uh, on the hip were two plates of um, ivory, carved ivory. And some of the local vessels, base ring and white slip too. And of course, again, a lot of mycenaean imports. Um, so we can date it to approximately uh, the late Cypriot 2B to 3C early period, so somewhere between 1350 and 1250. And this is one of the highlights. So um, the chariot crater, um, it shows a uh, chariot uh, walking to the right uh, with uh, three persons uh, sitting in the chariot. And there are persons also walking towards uh, the horses. They have some sort of swords. Uh, and then there's also a person walking uh, behind uh, the chariot. So these are the rich tombs uh, uh, from the late Cypriot uh, 1 to 2 period. We do ha also have another. Uh, sort of tombs. And uh, tomb A is actually a well that has been reused for the burial of uh, seven skeletons, six skeletons. Uh, so one is here, skeleton five, and a dog. And what you see here is a very strange, po strange position for a burial. So that skeleton was complete, but it was a bit twisted. It was not the lying in a way that you would actually uh, bury a person. It looks uh, much more as if this uh, person was thrown in the well. And a um, lady with an artificially deformed cranium, uh, very bad uh, state of health and teeth. So to summarize, tomb A, it uh, was a reused well 
uh, it contained burials in quotation marks because the question is if we should really refer to them as burials of six individuals and a dog. There are no tomb gifts, only personal belongings like a finger ring and a bracelet, but very few. Uh, and very little pottery in general in the backfill, but luckily for us for dating, there's a white painted wheel made um, deep bowl on top and one in the bottom, so we know um, all these burials are located in the first half of the 12th century BC. But this is not unique at Hala Sultan Teke. We found a second well, like Tomb A in 2017, Tomb Zeta 9, again a well, and again skeletons uh, buried in awkward positions. Uh, so we had five individuals here, a male, a female, and three infants, of them two newborn babies. So maybe a family, who knows. Again, we have no tomb gifts. We have very few personal belongings, like a bronze pin and a glass bead, not much else. And uh, thanks to the pottery in the fill, we can also date this pit to the oh, well, burial, whatever, to the late Cypriot 3A period. So again, we are in the 12th uh, century. To summarize, um, we do have some sort of necropolis in this area, um, but apparently also some cultic area um, in this area A. It is untypical for late Bronze Age settlements on Cyprus. So we have these intramural tombs, uh, we have cemeteries, but we don't know where the settlement is. But at Hala Sultan Teke we have both. We have intramural tombs, we have extramural tombs, um, and we also have some cultic activities going on there. These activities are attested from the late Cypriot 1A2 or uh, 1B period, so uh, in uh, absolute terms from the 16th-15th century on, until the destruction uh, of the city in late Cypriot 3A. So there's a continuity of use of this area. Uh, we have rich tombs until the end of late Cypriot 2C. Um, uh, we have many imports in these tombs, far-reaching intercultural connections. Uh, and from late Cypriot 3A on, we have these burials in wells, very poor burials. But we know the city was still very wealthy. Uh, but we also have to keep in mind that we do have uh, at least one rich tomb from the late Cypriot 3A period, which is in the city, tomb 23, which contained, amongst other thing, things, a bronze drinking set, um, uh, bronze trident, gold jewelry, precious stones, uh, scarabs, uh, game board, pottery, and so on. It was excavated by Peter Fisher in 79, and this is some of these. So we uh, apparently also have tombs that reflect the wealth of the city in the 12th uh, century. Uh, we have pits of two types, so one of them uh, contained complete vessels and other objects, which could be interpreted as votive uh, offerings. And the pits of type two with the broken tableware, possibly as remains of feasts. Um, it would be interesting to re-evaluate also some of the well fillings, because they have fillings that are like these pits of type two. Uh, and we have this uh, geographical connections of tombs and these pits uh, that I've shown you before. They are just a few meters uh, apart from each other. So we might assume that uh, these uh, pits reflect rituals in connection with the commemoration of uh, the dead. And this is a so far unique feature in late Bronze Age Cyprus. Uh, still, 
as I said before, we should uh, maybe reevaluate and rethink some of the already known features. Uh, we might find some more of these. Okay, uh, the, the last uh, couple of minutes, uh, uh, I would like to, to uh, uh, continue to try to answer this question, but I have to correct you. 1979, Tomb 23 was excavated not only by me, but also by Leonard Ostrom. You remember? We discovered a tomb with our electromagnetic devices and we excavated it during a couple of days and quite amazing results. So, okay, how could these people afford? And by the way, this is Leonard. This is from Tomb 23. 1979, my God, almost early Bronze Age. <laughs> so, uh, and, and one, one, uh, one wonders, I mean, all this nice stuff, these, these goodies, and uh, how could they afford to, to import this stuff? And so uh, uh, I try to answer this question, trade. So I guess trade was one of the, the, the main factors for the wealth of this city. And... Um, uh, also, co production of uh, copper, uh, intra-urban uh, 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 production of copper, and here's a, a reconstruction done by one of uh, my assistants, showing a storage area, and next to the storage area, a furnace, and next to the furnace, to the north of another furnace. So. And this is the area where, where all this slack come, comes from. So this is very important for the people of Halas and Teki. And here you see a bronze ingot, which you found in a pit very close to this uh, uh, mass of uh, uh, um, copper slack. And it, it weights uh, exactly 1.5 kilogram, usually called in the literature as bun weight, uh, bun ingot, but I, I do not like this name because bun has not, has not a hole in it. So I know I, I, I would prefer to call it donut, donut ingot, I don't know. <laughs> it's just a matter of nomenclature. Then we have uh, uh, evidence of casting. Here's a mold for a ring, steatite. There are other molds for arrowheads and tools. So they produced uh, bronze objects at Hala Sultan Teke, not only copper, but also bronze objects. And here a collection of, of some metals which we found uh, just from uh, Siku 1, uh, uh, mainly, mainly bronze, but also lead and gold. So then we have uh, textile production, purple dyeing, which was very, very important for as a source of income for the people of Hala Sultan Teke. And uh, a lot of uh, loom weights and spindle worlds. This is a reconstruction of uh, how a loom uh, uh, could have uh, been uh, uh, constructed. This is uh, done by the University of Copenhagen. And instead of um, uh, these loom weights, other loom weights were used at Hala Sultan Tiki, the pyramidal one, the truncated ones. So it's not, not totally correct, but approximately. And a lot, a lot, a lot of murex. And here is a basin where we still have remains of uh, purple color. And the reconstruction of the house uh, where we found this basin. And I believe the stratigraphy points to that, that the basin was on the top of the house, not at the bottom. Maybe, maybe because of the smell. But the smell was awful, really, really bad. So. Maybe it was better to have it on the roof than on the ground. Other products for export, agricultural products, animal husbandry and pottery. And uh, one should not forget, there's another site very close to Hala Sultan Teke. Uh, it's Trippes. Approximately one kilometer to the west of, approximately to the west of uh, Siku 1, City Quarter 1, and from there some amazing finds uh, have been done in the past uh, during rescue excavations mainly. A quite unusual uh, 
uh, bichrome wheel made ware with uh, 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 a warrior painted on it and uh, a beautiful figurine and base ring and, and seals. And this is in the museum in, in Lanaka, in, in the courtyard of the museum, one of these huge vessels from Trippes. So uh, I would say that Trippes uh, function as a kind of source for agricultural products. And maybe these, these products were shipped from Hala Sultan Teke. It's just at one kilometer to Trippe. So this was a kind of a granary for, for Hala Sultan Teke. And, uh, and again, all this wealth, uh, uh, maybe, maybe as, we, as I've shown before, comes from copper production, purple dyeing, and agricultural, agricultural products. What was imported? We found a lot of uh, Nile perch and uh, uh, also another type of uh, Nile fish, the blue talipia, tilapia, sorry, tilapia, which was recognized by David Rees. And maybe these, these fishes were imported dry, in dried uh, condition. Maybe they were imported in the so-called Canada jars. This is just a theory we have. And uh, as Teresa has shown, this is an import, a very early import, one of the earliest import from the, from the Mycenaean world uh, and all these uh, chariot craters. Uh, and this one uh, needs uh, uh, parallels and I have uh, looked for parallels for this one. It's a typical uh, Minoan dress and uh, I show you some parallels. This is from Corinth, the same dress from Knossos, from Mycenae and from uh, uh, Terra. But you know, the best parallel, really the best parallel, I found in New York, in the Fifth Avenue. It's, it's amazing, I mean, uh, nothing new under the sun. This is quite, really quite amazing. I mean, look again at, at, at the design of this. Uh, this uh, you agree, or? <laughs> okay. So, um, and uh, this is just a, a, a summary of what, what uh, the imports from uh, different parts of the Mediterranean. So we have imports from all over the place. And uh, I would also, also like to show imports uh, or a Mycenaean product, Cypriot products, sorry, Cypriot products which were found in, uh, in the rest of Europe. It, the next picture. So conclusions, the economy of Hala Sultaniga was based on trade and exported goods, as said before, copper, purple dye textile, pottery, most likely maybe foodstuff. Imported goods were pottery and precious metals, precious stones, and also food stuff. And this is a, a map of uh, late Cypriot finds around the world. And we have uh, now evidence based on lead isotope analysis. And this is a matter of uh, very, very, uh, let's say, hot discussions. Uh, we have evidence of Cypriot copper in Scandinavia. So around 1600, 1500 BC, before they used the, the, the Swedish copper mines, there are a lot of copper mines in Sweden, but before that period, according to Johan Link, uh, it's one of my colleagues at the Institute in Gothenburg, the latter sort of analysis point to Cyprus. So, and uh, this was the last uh, picture, and uh, I, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.
Okay, is that better? Yeah. So my question was, do you see any chronological correlation with regards to what is intra and what is in that area? Do you see things changing or you see things throughout or do you see changes in status or some form of diversification that would explain shift you know of practices it, uh, uh, we don't have we don't have so many tombs to compare but uh, let's say the intramural tombs are a little younger than the tombs which we found in uh, area uh, a do you want to Yes, yes. Uh, so this is one thing. The other thing, of course, we have a problem uh, as regards those tombs used for a very long period. We are not able to find out <laughs> which burial belongs to what person and so on. Uh, another problem is, of course, all the looting uh, that was going on in the 19th uh, century. So we do have the <laughs> material, but uh, difficult to uh, locate it where it comes from exactly, although we know it might be Hala Sultan Teke. Um, but uh, one thing that we have are these strange well burials in the 12th uh, century. And actually the activities seem to almost stop in area A around 1200. We only have these uh, well burials so this is definitely something going on in the in the use of this area in, in that period, yes. There's another thing which is, uh, uh, my opinion, very, very interesting, and it should be investigated further, and this is one of the objectives of the project. Uh, the tombs in Area A are much older than what we have in the settlement. So where is the old settlement? So I, I, since we are approaching now stratum 3 and stratum 4, hopefully we will find the old settlement because these tombs must belong to a settlement. They are not just uh, tombs uh, because of... But they're not, they're not like Engomi where they found the structures and then they open the tombs underneath the streets or in open areas connected. They, are, they seem to be outside. So you don't find in the settlement early, no. like... 16th century. No, that's no, no. The, the that's very. Let's say, late Cypriot 2C. So far, so far, and the others are late Cypriot uh, at least 1B, even 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 earlier. So, one day, hopefully, we will find the old settlement, and and I'm I'm uh, uh, very optimistic uh, as regards uh, qu uh, a city quarter four. So uh, since we have fenced it now, so we can work without any problems with uh, future farming and destruction and so on. So hopefully we can present next, next year maybe already, <laughs> or in two years or three years. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you very much. So thank you, and thank you both from me as well. That was so interesting, and it's such exciting material you're finding. I'm just wondering, do you get a sense with all your sort of geophysical work and everything about the ancient shoreline, and do you think that the lake maps where the harbour was, and can you get a sense of that, or was it in a different place? Uh, we are collaborating with a French team, uh, David uh, Kanievsky and uh, Christophe, Morange. Christophe Morange, and hopefully we will find uh, the exact shoreline. But I think, I think, uh, I'm quite convinced that uh, the, the, the margins of today's Salt Lake were the margins of the beginning of the harbor of Hala Sultan Teke. So what we intend to do is, and, and I just uh, uh, thought about this uh, today, when I saw people walking over the Salt Lake, which is dry now, so uh, prospecting, geophysical prospecting, in order to find maybe shipwrecks, which would, would be the ultimate proof where the harbor was. There are two possibilities for prospecting. I discussed this with my colleagues in Berlin. One is to, to, uh, to do uh, uh, prospecting when, those, when the salt lake is dry. The other possibility is to do it from a boat in spring when there is, let's say, half a meter, one meter water. And maybe you could, could use uh, sonic methods or, or electromagnetic methods or magnetic methods, whatever. But, uh, but this would be very, very interesting.
Uh, do you have any explanation how this uh, uh, copper find uh, from Cyprus was found in uh, in Sweden? It went uh, through Europe, uh, people traveling through Europe. Uh, or have you any idea about uh, an exchange of? Uh, I, th I think the of amber, for example. Or I think the, the 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 most experienced person to answer this question is Matthias. Uh, sitting just behind you. But I would say uh, it's just a theory. I don't think about, uh, I don't think that uh, these uh, 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 bronze or copper ingots were transported uh, through the uh, Gibraltar, uh, 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 what do you call it, Gibraltar yes. Sound? Yes, uh, to Sweden. I think they were transported uh, uh, via land route over the Alps, Germany, Denmark, Sweden. This is just a, a, an idea I have. On the other hand, there's a lot of uh, copper in Austria, in Tyrol, a lot of copper in, in Spain. So, but, but according to my colleague and uh, the letter sort of analyzes uh, some, some of these uh, 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 copper ingots or bronze ingots came from Cyprus. So I, can, I, I, am, I, I, I cannot answer the question, I don't know. But I, I think they were transported over land. Well, with all these uh, new discoveries, um, you have indicated that there was about 50 hectares of uh, inhabited area. Can you make a risk? Can you take a risk and tell us what is your estimate, perhaps, of the population of Hala Sultan Teke at that time? Yes, uh, uh, I did in one of my publications, but uh, there, are, there are estimations. Uh, 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 Paul, my, my former teacher, Paul Ostrom, he, he talked about some maybe 10,000 people, but maybe more than that. And uh, what is, as regards your question, if we, if we make a follow up of this question, uh, what happened to these people? I mean, 1150, let's say 1150. This is just a, a possibility uh, to date the, the, the final abandonment of Hala Sultan Teke, but what happened to these thousands of people? I cannot imagine that all of them went to Kition. I don't think so. But then again, you have this sea peoples phenomenon and we, you have almost exactly the same pottery which they produced on Cyprus in Palestine. So maybe some, some of them, they emigrated to Palestine. And of course, you know about the Ramses III, the, from his mortuary temple, the, 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 the scenes with the sea peoples, the different kind of uh, sea peoples, uh, amongst them the, the Philistines, and the shared them with the horned uh, helmets. And uh, when you saw our God with the horned helmet, then of course the, you think about the sea peoples, the shared them, but uh, this is speculation. So I, I cannot, I, I don't know. What do you think? Any, any, any? My fifth hectare. Uh, well, as a follow-up then, uh, 10,000 people is not a joke. Uh, working in trade, metallurgy, all this, you did indicate that they have survived because of trade. Did you find uh, any, uh, any way of how this was organized? How, was, how this was organized? Yeah, was there any central authority? I mean, did anybody do his own thing or what? Uh, so, so far, we don't have any palaces. We don't have any, any let's say, uh, uh, clear economic centers, but according to what we saw in CQ4, all these huge buildings with ashla blocks and so on, I think these are ashla blocks, then maybe we have discovered the economic center of the city. Maybe the Wall Street of Hala Sultan Teke. Like an emporium. very small one about the, the, the bull figurine, the two bulls that you found. Is that a joint? No. The ones <laughs> that, no <laughs> this, <laughs> this was I just... I was going uh, to suggest bullfight. No, no, no. They were not joined. This is what... <laughs> okay, I, I thought they were... Because um, they're usually found. No. And this one reminds me of an identical one that we had from... Uh, sorry, sorry. From uh, Pilaco Kinokremos, it seems like the, uh, a very similar 
uh, work by a, a, an artist in, in probably the Argolid. I'm not sure if mm. you saw the recent. You, you agree? It seems very. You know, it also has a mark. Yeah. I should mention also that we have a parallel with with all these uh, field work. We have a lot of. Uh, uh, petrography going on and Newton activation analysis and radiocarbon of course and I was in a very fortunate position that in 2016 I received quite a huge grant and uh, then of course we can afford all these analyses. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the, the um Purple dye production is this is uh, being studied now, and and is it uh, is it s with this having taking place near the coast, and then the the shells have been brought as a secondary refuge here, or was it actually produced where you found it? The purple dye, yeah. I think so, because we have the basin, and we have not just one basin, we have several basins, but just in this basin we found traces of purple dye. And in the other basins, in one of the basins, we found uh, uh, sling bullets of clay. But I, I think this this basin, uh, the sling bullets of clay, were produced as a let's say as a secondary product during uh, wartime. They, they they needed sling bullets and they produced sling bullets of clay because lead was maybe not available anymore. Maybe during the last uh, days of Hala Sultan Teki. Uh, and it would be a little dramatic, and and maybe these these uh, these basins were also used for purple dyeing. We have so far three basins, and the size of them, mm, do you know now? Two by three meters, something, something like this, yeah. each basin, and uh, quite a low, quite a low, uh, uh, yeah, let's say, wall surrounding lime, kind of lime wall surrounding the basins. You saw it in one of the pictures. Many congratulations, and of course you will be back at the very end of October next year to give us a full lecture on the purple dye during our workshop. Um, now, is it possible that those twisted bodies in the pits are the result of conflict? Have, have they been studied? Have they been thrown in after having been killed? This is also possible. Um, so we, we don't know for what reason they are uh, uh, placed like that. Uh, uh, another thing which, uh, which we, we do now, at, at the moment, in fact, in Copenhagen, we do a lot of DNA analysis. We got a permit by the Department of Antiquities to, to, to export some uh, teeth and bones, and, uh, and uh, uh, we try to find out maybe these people who were buried, not buried, sorry, thrown into the well, are foreigners, for example. Maybe we can find out by DNA. This would be an explanation. The rich tombs for the local people, and these people were immigrants or slaves or whatever, and they were just thrown into the uh, well. And, uh, and between all the skeletons, there's a, there's a, uh, let's say a couple of decimeters of soil. Skeleton soil, skeleton soil, skeleton soil. But the same pottery on top and the bottom, which is late seabird 3A. Uh, so sorry, I have to approach you. Sorry about that. I wanted to ask Peter about the throwing of bodies into wells is very interesting and whether you would look at things like plague because we know from the records from Raj Shamra that these are things that are happening at this time. There are records of plague right through the Bronze Age and other periods. And I think at Amana they've been able to detect um, typhoid in some of the um, burials and deaths there. So that might be another when you have to get bodies out of the city, because otherwise, why would you just throw them into a, yeah, a, yes. a well like that? So yeah, this is a that will be very interesting to find yeah, out. So yeah. Yes, you're right. It's that's on the cards, is it, to do that? Absolutely, you're right. And, 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 
And of course, I don't know if we can get the, the answer to this question, <laughs> but hopefully we will get it. If we find the same DNA as, as in all the other burials, then I'm just um, I'm curious that the relationship of the city, as you describe it, seems so much with trade and obviously with the sea. We were talking about possibly finding ships and so on, but um, the illustrations that I've seen so far on the screen, I'm, I, I'm I'm just curious how many maritime representations you've found on the artifacts that come out from your site. It seems that they're mostly wheeled vehicles and that the, maybe that might have something to say about what happened, or at least the sea peoples, what, if they left by ship, maybe that was strange. I just find it incongruous that there is a land, the, the direction of artistic vision is toward, seems to be, from what I noticed, towards the land. And if you have an explanation for that. So what you what you ask uh, uh, is uh, if there are, why are there more, not more maritime uh, uh, illustrations or? Yes, but but uh, uh, these vessels, for example, this one is an import from. Uh, Mycenae. So the the of course they painted it in the Mycenaean tradition, and uh, I don't know. Do you have any? Well, join me in thanking Peter and Teresa for their. Thank you. Thank you.